waiting for it to get. Okay, I think it came up. Hey everyone, welcome to um, today. <laughs> the day 986 of quarantine. No, I don't know. Um, we are going to be talking about part three of your inheritance in Christ. We've already looked at um, the book of Kings of Naboth's vineyard, and we established that you are given an inheritance now when, when you come into Christ, when you come under the covering blood of Jesus Christ, you are given an inheritance now, and there is an inheritance waiting for you in heaven that um, the Lord himself holds on to, as the New Testament tells us. But we're going to remember with Naboth's story that tells that vineyard concept that is that is weaved between Genesis and Revelation to show God's growth and what he creates in us through salvation um, and Satan's want and need to attack it and tear it down and steal from it. It shows that massive narrative that we remember from Naboth that you are given an inheritance now when you come into salvation with Jesus Christ which is representing that land, Naboth's vineyard that he creates. The spiritual salvation that you should use as you grow into your salvation, as Peter will say, you have to grow into your salvation, that you should use to produce great fruits for the kingdom of God that should ultimately be used to fill and feed your neighbors and your family and the kingdom work around us. Um, and that it should ultimately lead to the harvesting um, for the father. Our work should lead to harvest season. And that we also are going to remember from Naboth's story, part one of this um, teaching, is that there is an enemy that Jezebel and Ahab represent an real and true enemy that is still coming after you to steal your inheritance, that it is salvation is not a one step process, but it is a Trinitarian process, process or tripartite um, process that requires the beautiful concept of sanctification of your entire life, growing into the image bearer of Christ and growing up into that. So it requires maturity, just like land requires maturity. It requires the Sabbath rest, just as land requires the Sabbath rest. It requires someone a farmer and someone to help it grow, which is Jesus Christ and God. Um, so we covered all of that on the first one about your inheritance. The second thing that we covered yesterday or the day before my days all run together is this deep concept of the daughters of grace or the daughters of Zahalafad. Okay. And that was a teaching to really kind of hit, which I think is so important for the church right now is to really grasp that all men, and I use the word men as the same way, this universal concept, all of those created in the image of God, both male and female, when you are in Christ, you are inheritance, you have an inheritance and you have a portion um, in Christ. And that portion, when we look at the one time in the Old Testament that um, everyone actually stopped and asked God, like, hey, we've always done it this way. And we've always believed one way about who can inherit. But now we're going to stop and ask God who can inherit the land that is the physical representation of our spiritual state of um, inheritance who can inherit it, you have God answer, hey, these daughters that are humbly coming and asking for a place are asking for a portion as we remember that it was Leah and Rachel who first said the word inheritance when they said, what portion of inheritance do I have in this? God is saying, hey, they are co-equal in this, co-reigning in this, um, just as, as Adam and Eve did at the beginning, that we kind of went back into that. So, but it really emphasized, we, they mention Korah's rebellion when they say, hey, our father was not a part of that rebellion, that we are not to come into this in rebellion. And um, as the world does with a feminist um, conversation or motive or agenda here saying, hey, I'm actually coming in rebellion against this. 
Jesus um, came humbly, constantly to do his work and people didn't let him do his work all the time. So he would just move on. And for so many of us in the church, that kind of leak, that has to be the example of Christ for us that, hey, I'm not here to be in rebellion or against people that do not believe as a woman I can teach or preach, that I have to humbly respect your opinion, but I humbly have to walk with God and keep moving to the next place where the Lord is calling me to do the work. Because ultimately we are responsible to God, the giver of the good gifts and not to men. So if you have any questions as I'm going through this on the third one, please type them on the side and I'll try to hit those. But um, so we're going to go into the third section now. We've gone from everyone's given an inheritance to all are given equal inheritance. When you're in Christ, there's no male, no female, slave, nor free man, Jew, nor Gentile. Now we're going to move into the concept of the burden bearing of inheritance until the king returns. And this this is so important in today's American Christianity. And I'm really going to be teaching this from that lens of, okay, we have a concept called American Christianity that looks very different than Christianity outside of America. And let's, I'm going to kind of use that as an example to really look at scripture and um, look at what is our job as a believer today and what is your calling as a believer today. This is one of the number one questions I get from people is how do you know your calling? Oh, the birdies out there. Um, how do you know what your calling is? How do you know how you, if you're hearing from God or not hearing from God? So we're going to look at this super important concept of what is your job as it comes to this inheritance, both in the um, time that you have now in the physical life and in the one that is coming and in millennial reign. So we are going to be looking at numbers three. And um, I honestly had not planned to teach this. I wasn't looking at this until I dreamt of this last night. And I woke up in the morning with um, numbers three, and I knew that we were supposed to go here with this um, inheritance teaching. So we're going to go straight in and see what the Lord has for us. Um, we are going to see here uh, that we're looking at the four divisions of the priesthood. Okay, if you just kind of like, what's the priesthood in the Old Testament? Really quickly, um, the, the priests come from the tribe of Levi. The kings come from Judah, okay? They did not intersect um, in Israel, all right? The kings were separate from the priest and what we would call church um, separation of church and state, if you will. So much so that you have kings, for instance, like Uzziah, who decides, oh, I can, I can be a priest also. I'm a great king. And he gets leprosy and ultimately, dies because he tries to be a priest and he's not allowed to be a priest. So um, God very clearly separated those roles out. Um, as the exodus occurs and you have people coming from slavery from Egypt being built into Israel, a nation, right? That's what the exodus is about, the 40 years. 40 always represents trials in scripture that can produce change, okay? But it 40 represents trials in scripture. So we see that process occurring um, through the Exodus, but Moses is the leader, the lawgiver, and Aaron, his elder brother, is the high priest, and it will be Aaron's line. Um, they are Levites. Moses was a Levite and came from the Levitical, as we call it, tribe, which originally came from Jacob. Okay, Genesis 49, you see that Jacob had 12 sons. Um, I, I can't remember if it's mentioned like 21 times this list is given in scripture of these 12 sons, but it's always different. You'll see that the list in Revelation is different than the list in Genesis. So it's kind of very interesting to take note of who's missing or who's added. The Levites will be... Um, um, so Levi was from Jacob and Leah, okay? And the Levites will become the priesthood of Israel. So you have this continual family tribe concept that is passed down for the um, high priest in Israel. But here in Numbers 3, you're going to get those Levites, that tribe being divided into four divisions, okay? And let me give you, we're at Numbers 3, and we're looking at the four divisions of the Levites. Number one, 
it's the Aaronites, okay? This is the ones that will be from Aaron. Eleazar um, will come after him because the first two are killed for being disobedient. So his son Eleazar will continue and it's called the Arianic line of the Levites. They are the high priest, okay? Number two, you're gonna have the Gershonites. And the Gershonites start in Numbers 3, 21. So you can write, this is a division of the Levitical priesthood, the Gershonites. Um, number three, the Kohathites, okay, Kohathites. And number four, the Mirrorites, all right? So these are the four divisions in the Levitical priesthood. Sometimes, or a lot of times, you will see them listed as three divisions because they don't add Aaron into this. I will show you why I add Aaron and, and a lot of others add Aaron as a fourth division in the priesthood. So you have this division. Um, he tells them at the very beginning of Numbers 3, and we're going to look at verse 7. I counted up, I think this word guard, so 3, 7, they shall guard over him. This is their role as priest, okay? And then verse eight, they shall guard all the furnishings of the tent and the meeting. They shall keep guard over the people of Israel in the tabernacle. The job of the Levites is the priesthood, but the description, if you will, of their job is actually to shamar. The word in Hebrew is first mentioned in Genesis 2.15. And it's very notable that God placed Adam, he was, remember, Adam's created outside of the Garden of Eden. He is placed inside of the Garden of Eden to shamar and avad. These are the two Hebrew words used in Genesis 2 that describe Adam's whole purpose. And as I raise sons, I'm, I'm hoping that they get, this is your whole purpose. And my husband's purpose is to shamar, which means to guard, right? He's a protector. That's why God created him the way he is. And he's also to avad. He is made to work. This is before the fall. And men that do not work, create a massive problem in identity in I mean in so many areas of their life fall apart if you have generations of men or groups of men or even individuals of men that do not work then they're going against the exact thing that they were created to do by God and so you see them uh, they become miserable so um, right here, the, the priesthood, the Levites, the tribe of Levites are meant to guard the inheritance, right, of the people of Israel at this time. Okay, this is before land has been separated out. This is when the tent um, is, the tabernacle is movable and they're moving around. And so the guarders of that inheritance at this point is the tabernacle. And they're being told, hey, you're, you're supposed to guard and work it for people. It's so important to grasp this because I believe as, as we're gonna get into, this is your purpose. When you're asking God, what's my purpose? He created you to be a holy priesthood. First Peter will say you are a royal priesthood, which I wish we could get into because now you've got the king and the priest together. There's only three of those in scripture. That's Melchizedek. Jesus Christ and you, right, that have that combination together. But here you get the point of you being a believer. You should shamar and you should avad for the inheritance of God. This is your job. So now you have these divisions that come in after they establish it. He's going to go on to say, hey, of other tribes, you have to dedicate the firstborn of every family to me, okay, of other tribes. But here he's going to say um, in verse 13, this is Numbers 3, 13. He actually makes, there's different rules for the Levites. And, and this is what I want you to take notes of these because there was different divorce rules, different levels of responsibility that once you were, um, if you were in a Levite, you had a harder life in some ways because you had more responsibility. And this is true for those that are in the kingdom of God. He has a higher level of responsibility for you and a higher level of expectation. And it's wonderful, um, but we need to reclaim that and, and stop just acting like, oh, you can do whatever you want when, when you're a Christ. No, it says like, don't use your freedom to rebel against me, but realize like there's a higher calling for you once you're in Christ. Um, 
So here in verse 13, he says, so the firstborn of the Levites are, are, are of the tribes are mine. On that day, um, he says that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I consecrated, the word there is Kadesh, I made holy, I set apart for myself all the firstborn of Israel, of man and beast. They are mine, I am the Lord. But what does he say about the Levites? He says all of the Levites are mine. Okay, so it's not just the first part. He's saying all the Levites are mine. He'll go on and say, list the sons of Levi by father's houses and by clans. Every male from a month old and upward, you shall list them. So every male is counted in this. Every male is counted in this. And from the age of one month up, we'll find if you went forward um, that they didn't start service until the age of 30. That is when you entered service. It's when you could become a rabbi, a priest was 30. This is why Jesus gets baptized and it says about, he was about 30 or almost 30. And he goes into the wilderness and becomes 30. So he fulfills the law. And that is when he begins his full-time ministry, when he's fulfilling the law of the Levitical priesthood, which is in his lineage. Okay. So here they're going to start saying, hey, we're going to count them. And they so important to count them. And I want you to grab this. They're counted by God. And I believe you and I are counted in the same way way if we actually look at what this means. So here you have Gershom. Um, you're going to see that um, Gershom means exile or sojourner. All right. I want you, you can spend time on your own reading this, but I'm just going to give you some details quickly. Um, back in Numbers 2, we found out that all of the tribes were divided to which side they would stop or, or pitch their tents around the tabernacle. If you do the work on this, you find that it makes the sign of the cross around the tabernacle because Dan is to the north with Ephraim um, to the west is going to be um, sorry. Um, Dan is the north side. I was I always get my directions all. You've got Judah below Dan over here, Ephraim up here and and Reuben over here. That's right. So Reuben's on the south side. So you, you've got this picture of the cross being built. Well, guess what? The Levites are going to be separated out in the same way. Gershom is going to serve the West side. And, and just to give you what their job is. So within the Le Levites, now their jobs are broken down even further. The Gershom will serve what we were going to call the outer court concept. It is their job to pick up and move their movers of heavy burdens they're going to pick up and move this stuff when it's time for the people of God to go. When the spirit of God is moving, it is upon Gershom to get the outer court stuff collected and taken off. OK, and move it to where God is going. This is a great remez in scripture, right? The um, rabbis and the sages called it a remez moment when you get a hint of something deeper in the logos word. OK, there is a huge remez happening here. So then you're going to go to the next one, the Kahafs. They their name means assembly. Gershom meant exile right? It meant sojourner. This is what the Jews are at this point. They're, they're, they're broken down slaves that are trying as exiles and sojourners that God said, you will be exiles and sojourners in the land. And, and they're coming together and God's trying to assemble them like Play-Doh or dry dough that keeps cracking and breaking off. And he's having to pick it up and put them back together. So the Kothites, they serve on the south side, okay? They're on the south side, of the tabernacle. We're talking about the tent, the movable house of God at this point. And so they will serve in what we call the inner courts. Their job is to get the inner court stuff, all right? The utensils, the trays, the tongs, um, the lamps, the vessels of oil, all where the holy of holies would be, the inner court. Their job is to come, pick it up, and move it when God says to move. Um, it is from, we're going to come back to them because they're super important and we're going to focus in on them in one second. But the next one are Merari. 
All right. And their name means bitter. They are the north side. And if you want to write what they do or their job, good morning, Don. Sorry, I just saw that. <laughs> um, if you have a question, by the way, stop me and just type it on the side and I'll try to catch it so I can um, keep up with everybody. So the jar, the job of the tribe of Merari, which means bitter. If you remember the story of Ruth and Naomi, her name means, she says, call me Mara, right? They call me bitterness when she comes back to Israel. Um, they're on the North side and they are what we're going to call be called the structural integrity. Okay. Of the tabernacle. It is their job to move, um, all of the, the poles and the tent and all of the stuff that gives the structural integrity of the outer part of the Tim of the tabernacle. So it's really fascinating because even here you see this um, really neat parallel to the, the body that we live in even today of that inner court, the spirit. Those are, you know, like those that are priests to the inner inner healing and inner self of mankind. And then you see those that are the outer, the mind. Right. And then the structural, the body that you're still living in. So it's really neat how God so layers these um, these concepts in. But finally, you get to Moses and Aaron. So this is why the Arianic or the Aaronites would be the fourth division, because they don't mix in with those who are moving the stuff, who are the load bearers, okay, for the, the tabernacle. They do something different than all of the other three divisions do. This part of the Levitical um, priesthood, Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons, they are called in verse 38. They are those that camp on the tabernacle on the east side. East is really important in scripture. There are four cardinal directions. And if you kind of start making note of them, I have a list in the beginning of my Bible. The four cardinal directions always mean something. East wind, for instance, in, in the book of Jonah and all through Jeremiah, it's constantly talking about judgment coming from God. And you enter the temple on the east side, moving west because you're moving from judgment. And as you go through the process of the temple or the tabernacle, you are going into holiness towards the west, right? You're being cleansed and made clean. It is the process of salvation that we were talking about at the very beginning, that you come into salvation by accepting Jesus Christ and the gift freely given. But the process of sanctification is the going through the, the like literally like walking through the temple. You got to go through these things. You got to go past the brazen altar and through the holy gates, right? You pass, you got to go into the holy of holies. And if you stop at the door because you said a prayer when you were 10 years old, then you don't understand salvation. Then salvation did not truly truly mean what it should because if you understand salvation nobody will stop you from going into this through the gates to go to jesus who you're searching for so right here the um it says toward the sunrise you camp on the east side towards the sunrise where moses and aaron and his sons guarding the sanctuary itself to protect the people of israel so their job is to protect the entrance it actually says you're guarding so that if any outsider tries to come in they cannot come in. It, it, this is repeated earlier too, that, that if any outsider tries to come in here, they're to be killed. And I want to tell you that this is, this is key to understanding scripture. This is key to understanding why the burning bush consumes but does not kill, okay, or does not burn entirely. This is key to understanding why the angel at the very beginning in Revelation, I mean Revelation, at the very beginning in Genesis is standing with a flaming torch. Why Why in Ezekiel, um, the man in linen sticks his hands in and grabs the coal and scatters it on the, the um, city. And, and this is what I'm saying. If you are not in covenant, then the holiness of God, the fire that you see all the way through scripture will destroy you because you will come under judgment. But if you are under the covering of Jesus Christ, then you will come near the holiness of God and you will be purified through the burning. This is key to understanding the concept of the ish, of the fire of God from Genesis to Revelation. And so here, 
They are put as guards to the entrance because the law, who is Moses, and Aaron, the high priest, the law and the high priest will guard the way in to the Father. The book of Hebrews is written. We do not know exactly who wrote Hebrews. I kind of love that. But um, Hebrews 8, 2 tells us Jesus is the minister of the true tent. Okay, I'm just going to jump to Hebrews. Hebrews starts laying this out. Um, also, he, um, Hebrews, let's just go to Hebrews 8. Hebrews starts laying this deep concept out that we need to understand this. Jesus is the great high priest. He is the one who fulfills the Arianic side of the Levites. We, in our lifetimes, cannot be Moses to other people. It, we can't be anymore. We cannot go up on the high mountain and bring God down to other people. Even though um, Francis Chan recently said he thought for years this was his job. And then suddenly God told him, you're not Moses. Like, I don't need a mediator between man and God anymore because there is one mediator and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled the law, which is Moses, and became the great high priest, which is Aaron. And so it is only for him to sit in that part of the Levitical priesthood. We are the movers, okay? Like we're the people picking the stuff up and moving it for him who tells us where to do it. But we cannot go into the Holy of Holies for other people. We cannot save other people. We cannot preach good enough, well enough, hard enough, loud enough that is going to lead to salvation for other people if the Holy Spirit, God himself, is not moving in that person's life. And we have got to abandon the way of this American celebrity um, Christianity where we us constantly are raising up Moseses to fit the God, the, the hole that we have, the God-sized hole, because we want Jesus here physically with us. And so we take men and put them in that place and want them to be Moses. We want them to tell, tell us what God is saying. Tell us what, and it's like, no, stop doing that. Stop doing that and start learning to hear the voice of God for yourself and use the gathering, the church, as what it was meant to be, the gathering together of the believers in the upper room, together being the light of the world. So here in Hebrews 8, it says in 8-2 that Jesus is a minister in the holy places and the true tent that the Lord set up, not a man. Okay, this is going to be important just a second because we're going to look at Korah's rebellion. He is a he is not a man, right? For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it was necessary for the priest to do this and to have something to offer. This was Aaron's job and the son and his children's um, job. This was it. But they serve as a copy, a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed at God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. Okay, just stop. Go back to numbers and write up on the top, Hebrews 8, 5. This is a pattern, a prophecy of what is true, but it is not actually true reality of what exists. Sounds like a lot of philosophical big talking. Watch the matrix and you'll understand better. But look in the book of Revelation and we realize there's a true tabernacle in the heavenly place. God knew exactly what it looked like. And that's why he had such detailed um, directions and instructions to Moses of exactly how you had to make it so that you brought a piece of heaven on earth where God could come and dwell once again with mankind. OK, so this is so important for us to get when we're breaking down the Levitical priesthood. So by Numbers 3, 38 through 39, I want you to put this is the Arianic or the Arianite, if you will, um, section or division. And this is fulfilled by Jesus alone. We can't do this part. Now let's jump back to these guys called the Kohaths, right? Kohath, sorry. So the Kohath clan, 
Their job was the inner court guys. And, and I want to focus on this because I believe it's so important to us today as believers. The inner court guys moved the very holy of holy things, the things that were inside the tent. All right. So they're going to be touching all of this. But chapter four of Numbers spends an incredible amount of time and detail telling the Kohathites how they can't touch anything in there until it's been covered up by goat skin and then a scarlet, um, catch all these goat skin. Who wore goat skin? Oh, Elijah. Who was Elijah that had to come before to prepare the way? Oh, that was John the Baptist. Isn't it interesting how all of this works in pattern, right? So first goat skin has to come, prepare the way of the Lord, right? John the Baptist had to come. Then it's covered by scarlet. The blood of Jesus Christ had to go over it. Then then it's covered by blue heavenly linens, the heavenlies that came down, right? That was that people get to walk in now that Jesus has covered it. It had to be covered. Everything had to be covered before the Kohathites were ever allowed to come in and start doing the heavy lifting. Okay. This is so important that in um, Numbers 4, verse 17, the Lord gives a prophecy to Moses. Because in number 16, they're going to fail at this. The Kohites are going to fail. But he says in verse 17, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. I'm in Numbers 4, 17. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, let not the tribes of the clan to the Kohathites be destroyed from among the Levites. Yeah, let's let them not be destroyed, right? And so he said, but deal thus with them that they may live and not die. Okay, that's the first time he's saying it. He says, when they come near to the most holy things. So when you draw near to Jesus, to God, I mean, listen to this. He said, Aaron and his son shall go in and appoint them each to his task and to the burden that has to be put on them. But they shall not go on in to look at the holy things, even for a moment, but unless they'll die. So several things here. I told you Aaron and the high priest is Jesus Christ. You cannot go to God without the covering of the blood, without, without all of that on you. You cannot go into the presence of the Father or you will die. And so here he says, don't let them go in until you call them in, until everything's covered up, covered. The word covered that's actually used back in verse 15 it says, um, Aaron and his sons will have a, have a finished covering over the sanctuary. The word is kaka, K-A-C-A-H. It's first mentioned for the waters that covered the sin of the earth during the flood. That kind of covering has to go over these things for these men to be able to touch it. And it said, and then the sons of Aaron, the high priest, he will assign you your burden to carry. This is so important because you cannot find out your calling from God, your purpose that you were created for from any man. You must go to Jesus who created you. He, the high priest, must assign you your part in the burden carrying for him. He must be the one that speaks the words of truth to your life that I believe he formed you with in your mother's womb. When you hear those words, as I heard those words throughout my life, I, those were words I just knew deep inside me. I was created to do these things. I didn't know how I would do them, but I knew he had formed me in my mother's wounds with these words in my mother's womb because I knew them from the depths of me. So if you want to know what your part is, how you can carry the burden of the cross, if you will, that he already carried and said, daily take up your cross. He's saying, you've got to be a part of this. It is I who do the holy of holy things, the inner working. It is I that intercede with the Holy Spirit to the Father. It is I that am the mediator. Men cannot do this part but they can do the heavy lifting for me. They can be the hands and feet on earth. And when I say move, you get the stuff that I've covered with the glory. You get the stuff that I've covered with my covenant and you pick it up and you start doing the heavy lifting of the church that we so much require only one man to do usually. We have created a situation where we have one preacher to so many, to maybe 
5,000 to maybe a 500 we have created where we have one man doing all the heavy burden and we don't know what we're called to do in the church because there's honestly nowhere to serve in the churches in America but unless you're a chosen 10 to be on um, the worship team or something. But besides that, it's really hard to break through and find out what is every single person sitting in those pews job. And, and maybe this is saying, all of you are called. First Peter says, all of you that are in Christ are being built into a royal priesthood. So I believe God is saying, what is your division in this? What are you assigned to do in this? Because here it says, don't come close to this without Jesus, number one, because you will die. And the word there is balamuth, okay? It's used to be swallowed up by death and it will be used again and number 1632. You see, I told you that the Kohath um, tribe, the ones that were the ones with the inner courts, right? The ones that moved the stuff in the inner court that God said, hey, they're going to struggle with understanding this. The church struggles to understand this today. All right. Because we've given so much priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. But God's like, understand still that you're not Jesus for other people and you cannot be Jesus for other people. Understand that you had to come humbly submitting yourself to my ways. And so here, Korah's rebellion will literally come out of the Kohath division. The Kohathites in number 16 um, wanted to take over the east side. What, what do I mean by that? You see, in Numbers 16, and I'm going to read verse 5, um, Korah says to all of those in front before Moses, and remember, Korah is Moses' cousin, all right? He says, in the morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and bring them near to him. The one whom he chooses will bring near to him. So he's saying um, the man who the Lord chooses, he's going to be holy. You and, and Moses is like, oh, my goodness, back up from this. Because Moses is saying, I didn't choose to be the leader here. And Moses honestly didn't want to do it. Remember the burning bush thing? And he's like, whoa, and Aaron didn't want to be the high priest. You don't know what you're talking about. And Korah is saying, I'm going to be the man that the Lord is choosing. But remember back in Hebrews, it says the Lord who is not a man, right? Jesus Christ is the one the Lord chose ultimately. And Korah's rebellion, which is mentioned in the book of Jude, of the three individual sins, Balaam's sin, um, Korah's rebellion. Oh, sorry. These are the, the corporate sins for the church. Korah's rebellion, Cain's rebellion, and Balaam's era. These sins that you see in the book of Jude are all about this issue of division of the priesthood. We have to grasp hold that Korah's rebellion was about Korah saying he could do the job of Aaron and Moses. And there is one man who was God who can do that job. And it cannot be us. We can't do that part. And you walk in rebellion when you try to step into the role for your own life, for your children's life, for your husband's life, for your church's life. If our churches do not hear the voice of God more than they hear the voice of our preachers preaching on Sunday morning, then we are in an unhealthy place as a church. If our churches don't even know what God's voice sounds like because they're so used and dependent on listening to only one guy preach or one girl preach, then we are at a place where we're operating and we may not even mean to of putting ourselves in the place that only Jesus Christ can ultimately fill. And it becomes rebellion for us. So here you have the Korites that decide, hey, I, I can take out, I can take over the east side. And but God warned them in Numbers 4, 17, hey, they're gonna wanna try to touch the things that they can't touch. They're gonna wanna try because they're so close to it, right? Jesus allows us in there. And then we wanna be like, oh, I can, I can touch this. I can be this for other people. And it's so easy to slip into this lie. It's why when we tell others about the gospel and I speak, hey, this is what the Lord's telling me. And they go, I don't believe you. I go, no problem. I'm moving on. I am not God. I did not write this word. I am simply called to deliver it and move on because I cannot fight with someone hard enough to get them to believe in the gospel. It is not my job. And it is a rebellion to believe that I can do those things. 
So here, if you fast forward, you get so much about this service age. Jump with me to numbers four, and this is where I'm going to wrap up for 47. From 30 years old to 50 years old, everyone who come can come to do the service of ministry and the service of bearing burdens. If you are in the tribe of Levi, and I'm going to tell you right now, Peter tells you your tribe. Your tribe is Levi in the sense, in the spiritual sense of you're a royal priesthood now, which would be Judah and Levi together. But that's what Peter's saying. Like, no longer is there a certain tribe that gets to be the priesthood. God's people are the priesthood now under the new covenant. And Jesus is the high priest of that priesthood. And so here it says, you are called, you are counted, number one, the moment you're born. The moment you're born, you are counted, okay, as from God. And he's counting on you to do your job. He's counting on you to fulfill your purpose. It's why you have breath. He loves you. But if you are still breathing, then you still have a job to do for the kingdom. And here it says two things. You are called to avad ado, avado, which is you're called to serve for service. Your job is to serve. Who? The high priest. And number two. It says that you were called to serve of Massah. It means to heavy load, to bear the burdens, to be the grunt. Okay. And I mean it with just awesome grace that God's saying, you're not God. You're not the main character in this story. You're not the holy one. You're not the one that's going to save the world. You're the, the guy moving the stuff around for me. And what a great and wonderful place to be in that and and for some of us this offends us like no no god thinks i'm way more holy and way specialer than that and uh and i would encourage you to realize he loves you so much he sent his only begotten son for you it's not about love it's about realizing i'm not the golden star of this story I'm a mover trying to get God's stuff where he wants it. And he's telling me, hey, move here, move right, move left. And it's such a beautiful place to be when you realize I am a royal priesthood, but I'm not the high priest. I'm called to not act in rebellion, to not try to serve in that position, but to listen to the voice of God and bear the burden that he has put on me. Here it says, according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses, this is Numbers 4, verse 49, they were listed, each one with his task of serving and carrying. Uh, my prayer, when you start listening to this and thinking through this, and, and as this is a part of your inheritance as being a royal priesthood in Jesus Christ, is that this verse would just become a remez word. Like a, it would jump off and motivate you every single day to realize you are called to have your name listed in the book of life. And further than that, I pray to the Lord. I pray I'm listed in this Levitical priesthood line as someone who served and carried the burden that he assigned me. I want to stand at the end of this life and I want to say, you told me to put this on my shoulders and burden carry for the kingdom. And I pray I did it well. I know I fell over and over and over again, but you said to run the good race. You said to have my name listed and counted, and I pray it counted for your glory alone, that my name will be forgotten. My crown, I will, I will throw down on the ground and it will be for Jesus Christ. It will be all for the glory of God that I have done this. But I pray that when they, that that list will have my name on it that I served and I carried the burden of inheritance of his people, of Naboth's vineyard, that I was out there working and plowing at it, that I realized my position, my identity is someone who does have a portion in it. No matter if I'm a male or female, God has given me life to have a portion in this. Finally, just so you know, the Levites are known for not having land. We've been talking about inheritance being tied to land. The Levites didn't get land. They got these refuge cities they could go to, but they didn't get land and the allotment of land to the tribes. But 
If you listen to rabbis, if you listen to Jews talk about this, they talk about the age of Mashiach, the age of the Messiah, because Ezekiel 48 outlines that in the age that we would call millennial reign, when the return of the king happens and Jesus Christ is serving and sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, when we no longer need the son and for a thousand years he is going to serve in um, on the earth, when we are resurrected in the first First resurrection and the temple is built on earth. Ezekiel 48 says that the Levites will have an allotment of land. The physical inheritance comes then when the city from that time on is no longer known as Jerusalem. But verse 35 of Ezekiel 48 says it's known as Yahweh Shammah. The Lord is there. It is only used one time in all of scripture and it's used right here when God will be present in the city of Jerusalem. It is then that the Levites have a physical inheritance and the sons of Zadok have an even more special inheritance there. And that would be a whole nother teaching. But here's what I want to tell you. They have a gate to go into also. Right now, we started this conversation off at the first teaching about so many in the church are promising that your inheritance is going to be physical, that money is going to just, um, if you ask God, he will just give you money. You, you don't have to work. You can just sit around and pray to God and ask for money. Or if you have a um, business, you can just ask God for money. You can ask God for blessing and wisdom. I believe that. But please don't misunderstand inheritance. We right now, if you could put it this way, are in the tribe of Levites. Our inheritance is not physical during this time frame. If it was, then we once again are saying the church of Iran, the fastest growing church in the world is not valuable to God because they have nothing. They don't even have buildings. So if the most important part of our American church is building bigger buildings so that we can show how blessed we are by God, we are missing what inheritance means. Inheritance for the believer in the physical does not come until millennial reign because your inheritance is being physically with Jesus Christ now and then. Right now, your inheritance is a spiritual concept of truth that goes past the physical, goes past your past, past your future, and it spreads wide its arms into truth and is held in the heavenlies by God. That's your inheritance. But I pray that you will be someone that builds like Naboth, that claims, I can't give this away because I don't even own what I got. It was a gift freely given. So when the enemy comes and asks for it, you can't have it from me because it is God's. He is the one that holds on to my salvation and I will hold on to him as Jacob does. It is God's land. I belong to God. And so then I hope that you realize you have a portion, just like the daughters of grace, you have a portion in this inheritance, even if you're a woman, even if you're a less than, even if you've got a long list, you have a portion and God created you to be a part of this big picture that he calls the redemptive plan of the world. And then finally, guard your inheritance as the Levites do. Guard the inheritance of the king because that's your job. Position yourselves around the temple day and night, day and night. But realize we cannot participate in Korah's rebellion and think that we can take on the high priest, that we can take on the law. It was Jesus alone who fulfilled those things. So I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ, that your name will be counted in that list of those who served and those that carried the burden that Jesus Christ has asked you to carry in this life. For it is, that burden is a great, beautiful thing that is a momentary affliction before eternity. So I pray that over you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.